Good afternoon. God be with all of you. This afternoon, our text before the lesson comes from 1 Chronicles, verses, uh, chapter 13, verses 1 through 14. 1 Chronicles 13, verses 1 through 14. These are God's words. David consulted with the commanders of thousands and of hundreds, with every leader. And David said to all the assembly of Israel, If it seems good to you, and from the Lord our God, let us send abroad to our brothers who remain in all the lands of Israel, as well as to the priests and Levites in the cities that have pasture lands, that they may be gathered to us. Then let us bring again the ark of our God to us, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. All the assembly agreed to do so, for the thing was right in the eyes of all the people. So David assembled all Israel from the Nile of Egypt to Labo Hamath to bring the ark of God from Kiriath Jerem. And David and all Israel went up to Baalah, that is, to Kiriath Jerem, that belongs to Judah, to bring up from there the ark, which is called by the name of the Lord who sits enthroned above the cherubim. And they carried the ark of God on a new cart from the house of Abinad. Say it. Abinadab. Exactly. <laughs> and Uzzah and Ahio were driving the cart. And David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, with song and lyres and harps and tambourines and cymbals and trumpets. And when they came to the threshing floor of Kaidan, Uzzah put out his hand to take hold of the ark, for the oxen stumbled, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against Uzzah, and he struck him down, because he put out his hand to the ark, and he died there before God. And David was angry, because the Lord had broken out against Uzzah, and that place is called Perez Uzzah to this day. And David was afraid of God that day. And he said, how can I bring the ark of God home to me? So David did not take the ark home into the city of David, but took it inside to the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. And the ark of God remained with the household of Obed-Edom in his house three months. And the Lord blessed the household of Obed-Edom and all that he had. May God bless the reading and preaching of his word. Amen. Please be seated. I don't recall how many sermons I heard as a new Christian on the story of Uzzah and the ark, the one I just read, but it was quite a few. And typically they were based upon the 2 Samuel 6 account, which to my thinking is not nearly as helpful for understanding the theological significance of this story as 1 Chronicles 13 and 15 are. Nevertheless, the thesis of these sermons typically boil down to the following two points. First, that while Uzzah was sincere, while he was just trying to prevent the ark from falling to the ground and being destroyed, and so he reaches out to steady it. While he was being sincere, God condemned his law violation anyway. The second point, which follows from that, is that this text teaches us that divine judgment is executed even against technical violations meaning that any deviation from God's law, regardless of the reason, regardless if it's based upon ignorance even, brings God's condemnation. Good intentions, in other words, matter not in God's law court. What is required instead is technical precision, a kind of ritualistic perfectionism, we might call it. And it was not just the tradition, uh, within the tradition that I came to faith in that offered this, maybe we call it severe or punctilious reading of this event. 
because one finds similar interpretations within, within the Reformed tradition, both among the Puritans as well as later British Presbyterians and others. However, regardless of its history, the God envisioned in this interpretation, it seems to me, is deeply problematic. In fact, the understanding of justification that it depicts, I would argue, borders on the blasphemous. Scholar John Mark Hicks aptly describes the draconian despot of this interpretation as the god of technicalities, a tyrannical taskmaster from whom every technical disobedience is viewed as a brazen act of insubordination. Even if you are an innocent bystander rendering aid, as Uzza was, the God of 2 Samuel 6 will smite you. To envision Yahweh in such a dim light is to seriously underestimate not only the nature of his love, but even the nature of his holiness. This is especially true of the God who is depicted for us in the book of Chronicles. According to the chronicler, the God of Israel does not scour the earth hoping to find technical lawbreakers. Rather, he searches high and low for men who are after his own heart. Second Chronicles 16.9 says, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth, that he may strongly support those whose heart is completely his. This indeed is the thesis statement of the two books of Chronicles, that God seeks seekers. First Chronicles 28 verse 9 says something similar. And you, Solomon, my son, this is David speaking to Solomon, Know the God of your father and serve him with a whole heart and a willing mind. For the Lord searches all hearts and understands every plan and thought. If you seek him, he will be found by you. But if you forsake him, he will cast you off forever. Now, I just want to put a pin in this to remind us, to, just for you to remember, this is David giving this advice to Solomon, because we're going to come back to David in just a moment. And so while God certainly punishes those who continuously and rebelliously violate his commandments, he suffers long and remains steadfast in his love for those who seek him, remitting their sins time and again. Indeed, this characteristic of God as seeker is first revealed to the reader of the Bible all the way back in Genesis 3. When God first places man in the garden, he commands Adam in Genesis 2.17 that he must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when he eats of it, he will surely die. Now, given this clear command and the clear consequence that comes, uh, that follows after it, we are unprepared for what comes next in the narrative. After Adam sins, and God goes looking for Adam, calling out to him, asking, where are you? Meaning that instead of forsaking Adam, what we see God doing is seeking after him. And not to put him to death ultimately, but to reestablish a relationship with his fallen image bearer. God, who is love, as John says, will not allow sin to stand between himself and his beloved. So he personally bridges the gap. This is a principle that's demonstrated time and again in the events recorded in the book or the two books of Chronicles. We see it in the story of Rehoboam. We see it in the story of Azza. We see it in the story of the northern pilgrims of Manasseh, of Josiah, and on and on it goes. Therefore, reading Chronicles should not create in us consternation over our lack of perfect compliance to God's law, which, by the way, we will never be perfectly compliant. But rather what it should produce in us is confidence 
that God will not count our ritualistic incompleteness against if, against us if we seek him with all our heart. Now, one passage which powerfully demonstrates this principle is 2 Chronicles 30, which Samuel read to us a moment ago. It recounts Hezekiah's restoration of the Passover. Following the kingdom's rupture, Israel suspended regular festal observance. And thus, for decades, the people of God were prevented from receiving the spiritual nourishment of the annual feasts, the Passover, Pentecost, the Feast of Booths, etc. And Hezekiah the king resolved to rescind that moratorium, to usher the people of God back to the Lord's table to partake of his banquet. However, as we read, his route to restoring the Passover due to his unique situation, was quite unconventional. The problem was that the priests, as we read, had not consecrated themselves in sufficient numbers, nor had the people gathered in Jerusalem in time for the normal observance. And in addition to this, many of the Jews arrived ceremonially unclean. They had not carried out the rituals of preparation because they knew not what they were doing. The customs had been lost to them. And so in this extraordinary circumstance, Hezekiah applied the the law of God. He applied his precepts creatively, we might say. For example, the king reinstituted the feast, even though the day and month that the law prescribed had already passed. And for those who were ceremonially unclean, he appealed to God for instant cleansing. We are given just a sample of this prayer in verses 18 through 19. I wish we had the whole thing because this must be one of the greatest prayers in all of the Bible. But Hezekiah says, May the good Lord pardon everyone who prepares his heart to seek God the Lord God of his fathers, though not according to the purification rules of the sanctuary. These men had not prepared their bodies for this ceremony. And Hezekiah prays, God, if they are seeking you with their heart, cleanse them. So Hezekiah is essentially asking the God most high, consider the boldness of this. Hezekiah is asking the God Most High to overlook the nation's disregard of his law. He is essentially saying to the Almighty, listen, we're going to ignore your clear instruction, and we want you to make it okay. This is a little bit like when Christians, and I know you've seen this and probably are guilty of it yourself, Christians will sit down to partake of a meal that is nothing but junk food, and they ask God to bless it to the nourishment of their bodies. It's funny, but consider the hubris of that for a moment. Essentially, you're saying, I'm too lazy or indulgent to eat the healthy food that your earth provides, God. And instead, I want you just to fix it by divine fiat. Right? Let us sin so that grace may abound. In other words, usually it's wrong to petition God to sanctify a transgression right before you do it. To say, well, let me pay the indulgence now because I'm fixing to engage in some thievery. So I'll be covered. Fixing, that was so Texan, wasn't that? That was the Texas translation of the Bible. So upon what possible grounds could Hezekiah justify this audacious prayer? Upon what principle could he permit these permutations to God's clear commandments, carrying on the Passover celebration, even though the law forbade it? Because did not such technical disobedience demand divine retribution, as in the case of Uzzah, regardless of the intention of it? 
Or we might say, why does Scripture refer to Hezekiah as an obedient king rather than one who was filled with damnable hubris? The key to the king's confidence, his brashness, was his deep understanding of the divine nature. Hezekiah knew from experience that God was a loving and merciful God, one who is ready to receive all those who earnestly desire to return to his favor, that God was a seeker of seekers. We see such insight in his call to the nation that we listen to. The call to come and renew the Passover celebration. Here's verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 30. For if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your sons will find compassion before those who led them captive and will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate, and he will not turn his face away from you if you return to him. And Hezekiah was right about that. The Lord heard his prayer, we are told, and he cleansed the people. And the nation kept the feast of unleavened bread seven days with great gladness, it says in verse 21. And the Levites and the priests Priests praised the Lord day by day, singing with all their might to the Lord. By the way, I want us to try to sing with all of our might the song after the sermon. Sing with all your might to the Lord. What would that sound like? This celebration was so edifying, in fact, that Hezekiah extended it for an additional week. Something also he wasn't permitted to do, according to the letter of the law. Clearly for this radical restorer, the gracious renewal of fellowship with God was more important than the particulars of the Passover, as one writer put it. What the king knew is what the scribes and Pharisees of Jesus' day had forgotten, that the Passover was made for man, not man for the Passover. Meaning that God's intention with regard to the Passover law, his intention, God's intention with regards to this law, trumps obedience to the letter of it. I mean, just think, for example, of how David was allowed to eat the showbread when his men were starving. Again, now notice this is an extraordinary circumstance. In what I'm saying here, nothing that I say here, let me be clear about this, nothing I say here is to give license to ignore God's law, the letter of the law. We are to be zealous for the letter of the law. Jesus tells the scribes and Pharisees, you should have done both. But notice in this extraordinary circumstance, the law says that David could not, he wasn't a priest, he could not eat of the showbread. But in this extraordinary circumstance, he did anyway. And the reason he is allowed to eat it is because in this situation, the spirit of the law trumped the letter of it. The law concerning the showbread was given for man's good. And thus, if adherence to it causes man true harm, right, if these men were to starve to death, then that adherence would go against the law's intended purpose. By the way, this is the exact reasoning that Jesus uses to defend his healing on the Sabbath. The point being that if one is forced to choose between the spirit and the letter, always choose the spirit. Right? It just If you can't do the letter, right? but you can do the spirit, It's not enough of an excuse to say, well, I couldn't do the letter, so I'm not going to do the spirit. A crude illustration of this is to consider what's sometimes called the minimum speed limit law that some counties have. You'll see it on a a sign, the speed sign, speed sign. The intention of this law, again, ultimately is for man's well-being, right? 
But is the intention of this law that one should not drop below the minimum speed limit even if there's a person on the road in front of your vehicle? I'm just going to keep... It says I can't go below the speed limit. The minimum speed limit law was created to keep people safe. And thus, if in your strict legalistic adherence to it, you injure someone else, you have missed the spirit of the law. You have chosen the letter over the spirit or instead of the spirit. But if this is the case, then why was Uzzah struck down? If he was simply trying to prevent the ark from falling on the ground and being destroyed, right? you might say the spirit of the commands concerning the care and transportation of the ark would, I guess, ultimately be the ultimate kind of defilement would be if it fell on the ground and shattered into pieces. If he was just you know, trying to keep the spirit of the law but missed the letter, then why was he punished as he was? Well, to answer that question, it's necessary to consider the details of that event a bit further. And this brings us to our text in 1 Chronicles 13. The first thing we should say is that it's clear that Uzzah violated the letter of the law. There's no question about that. According to Numbers 4.15, touching the ark, even by those who, by the way, were decreed to carry it. There was a certain group of Levites, the the sons of Kohath, who were set aside to be the ones to transport the ark. But even they, by the way, Uzzah wasn't part of that group. That's part of the problem. But even they couldn't touch the ark. If they touched it, that was a crime punishable by death. Numbers 4.15 says, And when Aaron and his sons have finished covering the sanctuary and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, that would include the ark, as the camp sets out, after the sons of Kohath shall come to carry these, but they must not touch the holy things lest they die. No one was to touch the ark because it was holy. In fact, it was the holiest object on the planet at the time. It was the very place where heaven and earth came together. Just as an aside, Your body is that place right now, by the way. Your body is the temple. It's the place where heaven and earth come together as the Spirit dwells within you. How holy is your body? It's as holy as the ark, in a sense. But this is the place where heaven and earth come together. As the high priest, once a year on the Day of Atonement, enters into the divine presence in the Holy of Holies, and sprinkled the blood of the sacrifice upon the lid of the ark, what was called the mercy seat, where God sits enthroned, as our text says. This is God's throne room, in a sense, on earth. Indeed, you might say that the ark was the holy of the holy of holies. Therefore, no one was to defile it by touching it. That's why it was covered. To touch it was a capital offense. However... There is a lot more going on here than just Uzzah and his actions. Because the larger procession was actually King David's responsibility, ultimately. He was the king, and it was his decision to go and retrieve the ark so that it might be returned to Jerusalem. Which is why he takes responsibility for Uzzah's death later in 2 Chronicles 15, 13. A concession which came after he consulted scripture concerning the proper procedure for transporting the ark. There was an elaborate procedure that was given. We read a little piece of it for how the ark was to be transported. This is something he had failed to do the first time. Corinthians, uh, Corinthians, uh, Chronicles 15, verse 13 says, because you, the sons of Kohath, did not carry it the first time, the Lord our God broke out against us. Because we, notice he takes responsibility, because we did not seek him according to the rule. 
This means that Uzzah's act was not an isolated one because the entire procession was an affront to God's holiness. David was leading the first pride parade, you might say, as he arrogantly danced before the ark, disregarding God's decrees. Therefore, Uzzah's actions could certainly have been motivated, I think, by good intentions. It's not ultimately his responsibility to ensure that this procession is scriptural. That was David's responsibility and the commanders that he consulted, which would then make Uzzah's touching of the ark a mere technical violation of the law. It was David himself who had violated both senses of the law, the spirit and the letter, as he oversaw the transportation of the ark on this new cart, which was also an innovation, instead of as it was meant to be carried, which was on poles. That's how God commanded. And that wasn't the only aspect, by the way, of the law that he neglected. The ark was also, as I said, to be covered. And everyone other than the sons of Kohath were to keep their distance as the ark traveled instead of dancing around the sacred object in careless celebration. And here is where we begin to see the striking difference between David's sinful disregard for God's decrees and Hezekiah's pious passing over them, as we might call them. Hezekiah knew both the letter and the spirit of the law. David, in this case, knew neither. Hezekiah had great affection for God's precepts and wanted to faithfully keep them. David couldn't care less in this moment. And not only did Hezekiah know both letter and spirit, he knew that he was obligated to keep the spirit even if he couldn't keep the letter. He understood that there is a hierarchy when it comes to God's laws. That if the scenario is such that the letter and spirit come into conflict, the spirit is always, as we said, to be given priority. David, of course, thought nothing of such things. All of which is to say that Hezekiah was a seeker, and David, in this case, was not. And the reason David was not seeking God at this time, we are told in our text, is because he didn't fear God. He didn't fear him. I know it seems paradoxical, although we've talked about this a lot lately, but if you truly fear God, you might think, well, that, then you would flee from him. If you're really afraid of God, you would run away from him like Jonah runs away. But the truth is, it's actually the opposite of that. Jonah runs away from God, not because he fears him too much, but because he fears him too little. Hezekiah feared God. And he knew that he better reinstate the Passover regardless of the people's ritual imperfection. That was not enough of an excuse. Because God desired the true purpose of the Passover to be fulfilled, especially in this moment, which was the renewal of his people. Indeed, what made Hezekiah so bold was this fear of the Lord. He feared the Lord more than his lack of technical obedience. He feared the Lord more than his poor ritualistic performance. Or maybe we should put it this way. Hezekiah feared the God of truth more than the God of technicalities. There are many Christians today, I'm afraid, who fear the God of technicalities more than the God of truth. Maybe this is illegal to admit this, but I went to the Bell County Republican Convention yesterday as a delegate. For the first time, I'd never been to a convention before. Because I'm a preacher, I'm not supposed to get involved in politics, right? And I got this sense, and I could be completely wrong about this. I don't want to misjudge anyone. But I got the sense that there are some scribes and Pharisee types in my party 
who care more about following Robert's rules of order to the letter than they do about creating the policies that those rules are supposed to help generate. In other words, they fear a failure in procedural precision more than a failure to bring God's will on earth as it is in heaven. The problem with all such scribes and Pharisees is not that they fear God too much, but too little. They underestimate the holiness of God. That ultimately was David's sin. And so as superintendent of this debacle, David then was in full violation, as we said, of God's law. And yet he was not struck down. Neither was the nation as a whole. David gets sort of the buy-in of everyone, as we read in our text. Does it seem good to you? Everybody in agreement? And yet the nation is not struck down either. Only Uzzah was. The question is why? Why does Uzzah alone receive the punishment? Why is he singled out? This is a truth that should stir in our hearts righteous indignation because it is unfair to punish an individual for the sins of his nation or perhaps even worse, for the sins of his king. To punish a commoner for the transgressions of his ruler is the very definition of oppression and injustice. And yet, ultimately, I believe that that's the point of this story. That's exactly, ultimately, what it's about. Meaning that the best explanation for the punishment of Uzzah, for his being singled out, is that he was serving as a scapegoat for his people. He was punished in their stead. Notice again David's language in speaking about God's punishment. He said, the Lord our God broke out against us because we did not seek him according to the rule. In striking down Uzzah, God was striking out against the nation's disregard for his law. But instead of destroying the nation, he poured out his wrath upon one man. When Uzzah touched the ark, it seems to me, he became a representative, you might say, of his nation. The whole nation touched the ark in that moment through Uzzah, and he became a lightning rod. Many throughout church history have viewed Uzzah as the ultimate villain, as an exemplar of shameful insubordination. We have considered him punished by God, stricken and afflicted. But what if we are to draw a different conclusion from this text? This story of one man satisfying the wrath of God on behalf of his people. God laying upon them, on him, their iniquity, imputing to him the punishment which brought them peace. Is this so hard to imagine? I mean, if the story of David and Goliath, as so many people have pointed out, is ultimately a picture of Jesus defeating the principalities and powers of this world, if Jesus is the true and better David, is it impossible to believe that Jesus is the true and better Uzzah? Is it impossible to think that Uzzah will be listed among the heroes of faith in the final tally instead of the villains of unbelief? I will say that God does seem to delight in shattering our expectations. I mean, Samson makes the list, which is shocking. But it seems to me that this kind of typological reading kind of reading of the Old Testament that we see the Hebrew writer have. I think this kind of typological reading best resolves the tensions of this text. 
and how fitting a story it would be to dwell upon as we journey through Lent, making our way to Good Friday, where we will celebrate the suffering servant who bears the sin of the world.